Hey, and welcome to episode three of Worth 1,000 Words, where I attempt to write a thousand word short story based on a piece of artwork. If you're new here, my name's Jason. I'm a fiction writer. And if you're interested in anything story related, whether that be movies, books, video games, writing craft, obviously, consider subscribing. If you couldn't tell, my foundation shirt might be a little hint at what we're doing today and that is going to be some science fiction but it's going to be a little bit different all right well let's move on to the artwork today's artwork is entitled robo rats by a tim razumovsky this is from his aurora noir series he's creating it's on his instagram i'll put a link to everything down below so this caught my eye because it's it's rendered in an almost photoreal nature the lighting is really what sells it for me and it's this anachronistic style art where you have these very retro robots in a terrible situation around these kind of a gangster era setup like in the 20s or 30s or something like that first of all this caught my eye strictly because of the style of it and i wanted to do something sci-fi i feel like it's going to be a challenge and choosing the pov is going to be interesting as i'm looking at this art now i think i'm going to go with the robot i think that might be the surviving robot obviously not the dead one that might be an interesting perspective let's see how i do thanks tim for giving me quite the challenge smoke and sparks yeah, I started at the head of the victim. I thought it was a good focal point to start everything up. And then, spoiler alert, as I said before, I did get, I, I am going for the point of view of the other robot, the one yet to be shot. And here I'm kind of starting a dialogue of uh, how, the, how the robot perceives itself, almost as if there's a prejudice there between man and machine, talking about the mind. And then I emphasize that with a dialogue from the man sitting in the chair. And then as we can see, this robot, he has feelings for his fallen friend. And then I decide to bring in Mr. Uh, Drinking Man, is what I eventually call him. Off to the side there. I think what was great about this scene is there's an opportunity for multiple characters and dialogue. So we have what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven people potentially. I only use three or four. One thing that definitely stood out was having that opportunity to have multiple char characters talk was allowed me to get through the words more quickly. Here I am talking... <laughs> I started off calling him the old man, and then I decided, oh, he needs some kind of Italian-esque name. So Caprello is what I came up with. And I'm starting to establish some of the, the technology here, which was quite a challenge on the fly to just come up with this stuff. We were just talking about upgrading his, his uh, I guess, emotional capabilities by laughing. I know this, this, this picture or this, this artwork is called Robo Rats, but I, I decided to do it a little bit differently. I add some more depth to it instead of these two robots strictly being rats and traitors to this to this gang. And so I establish here that name and name at this point, blank and blank, the two robots found something interesting, something big apparently, which I have no idea what it is. So yeah, we introduced the, the man behind him who shot the other one in dialogue and he stopped by Big Boss Caprello. And here, this is funny. So I... This popped into my head and I wasn't sure if I was going to make it true or not. The fact that this boss is actually a robot. And here I, I start talking about, you know, the, the stair was as mechanical as his own, meaning the robot's own. Iris is like the flash of, flash of ignition, which I capitalized at one point, almost as if that's the birth of a robot. And here I, you know, decided to make the cheesy comment of an, an acronym of soul which I had no idea what it stood for, but it, it sounded like something in a, that would be real. I work at a marketing agency and they like to come up with bullshit like that all the time. So it sounded, sounded accurate. Once again, I talk about that this robot's creating some kind of intercommunication algorithm that presumably allows robots to talk to each other. I don't know why, but it happened. I always thought, you know, docs were cool. So I, I, I decided they were sent there. And this is where person lived who had the key, or thing, I should say. And, um, oh, going up and down. So here I, I decide that this mob boss guy, he, he worked for some factory where these robots were created a long time ago. And I do use that to my advantage later, as you will see. Here I am with a Voc mod, like a voice mod kind of thing. More tech. 
I come up with a with a short sort of turn of the scene or, or twist, not twist, but element of the scene here where the uh, the secondary character with the with the alcohol and the cigar comes into play. And here I kind of further emphasize or hint at the fact that Caprello is a robot. He's not human. And more internal dialogue here, or internal monologue, I guess I should say, internal thoughts of the robot, um, alluding to what he found. And I bring back the second robot, the dead one, uh, signaling that he's still, you know, he's still in the mind of his companion. There's some emotion there. He's not just strictly a machine. And he, he couldn't look away because this, this smoke that was coming up off the head of his fallen friend ended up in his line of sight. And here I'm just making up a scenario. It's all fictional from the POV of the robot. He's just making this up to buy time. And exactly, the uh, the guy behind him, or actually, sorry, the guy with the drink, he's clued in on that. And here we see, this is the scene I was talking about, that it is kind of the, the turning point of everything. And you'll notice here that the robot is noticing that this hit was too perfect. I mean, this guy's sitting in this chair, his eyes averted from his uh, goon, and uh, he just flicks his cane up and hits him. And here, noticing compensated for asymmetry, which is a very robot thing to do. And I decide, what if he hits this glass, spills on him, and his cigar catches him on fire? I thought that would be a cool visual. You know, one showing the power of this this guy Caprello, as well as his feeling for human life, his, his capacity for for empathy or anything more than than his business and here we see that you know the rest of the guys they they're more human than caprello they decide that you know they pause they're exhibiting physical reactions to what happened with uh, wiping beaded foreheads before joining him and then here we go this is kind of the the uh the crescendo of the scene where caprello takes the the drink from the table and then decides to slowly turn it over onto the smoldering man, which further or which ignites the fire further, consuming him. But I also used this opportunity to where he lifted his hand off the cane for a moment. I noticed the cane had this orb like end on it, and I thought it would be kind of cool if there was something hidden there. And that is what the uh the first robot or well, not the first the surviving robot recognized and he saw there was some kind of module in there which is the brain of a robot a neuro circuit module i guess the brain something or other and then he sees something on the side etched ambrosia and really this this idea was was inspired by blade runner 2049 when they zoom in on the the remains the bones in the lab and you see a serial number so that's that's kind of that was the inspiration there and now we see that the uh, the drinking man has burned out and silence has resumed. And Caprello, Caprello speaks, still his mind on business. And further emphasizing, no blink, no sweat, not a breath. So we're getting the idea that he is not, in fact, human. And I put a little, there's a little timer countdown right here where the robot has 10 seconds and he's scanning his databases, trying to find ambrosia maybe the the the, uh, the breadcrumbs that i call them the details that the caprello gave him he admits it and he he kind of he goes off a off a, a a whim here or he, he takes a he takes a big risk by giving ambrosia a nickname and he pulled that information from the history cat 479 who is caprello um, had a fondness of nicknames, and it's something he picked up from his maker, I decide. And here we we show that the robot is, in fact, bluffing. He knows this detail. He knows that Cat 479, who's sitting in front of him, has some kind of fondness for, for nicknames, and Ambrosia is an important person in his life for some reason. Yeah, here we go. So something he had picked up from his maker, one of the first. He had the street information where the first where one, uh, one of the first uh, factories were. And then he had the name Ambrosia, which is wit written on the cane, or well, within the cane, what's housed in there, and how that must hold some significance. So I was really happy with that. I mean, that was kind of a cool turn where not only does the this Caprello or Cat 479 show his uncaring, <laughs> unsympathetic attitude toward killing one of his own men without even batting an eye, literally, without even looking. And then I also use that as a mechanism to reveal the secret that resides under his hand on the tip of the cane. And then introduce that countdown to, to create some tension there. And here we see that 
Caprello, that nickname, that that the robot uttering that nickname alone kind of turned him, I, I want to say primal, but he's reverting back to his robot form, form. So, you know, he's superhuman movements, you know, and then here's a robot thing, 20, 20 years, 35 days, 16 hours. Funny thing, I didn't even realize until after I was done, I, I decided, oh yeah, let me be really specific and count down from a long period to a short period. But I left out months and I left out weeks, so there's that. But it's all right. I'm not changing it. It's still in there in the final version, even after I, I do some pretty significant editing here and I never catch it. <laughs> yeah, here he tears the head off, the guy with the gun. And the robot, he's still in shock, so he's, he's maintaining his posture as shown in the artwork. But then the sound of all this uh, brings him back to the dock and the crashing wave, which uh, gives him the opportunity to run. Here I'm coming up with the robot names. I decide to use the letter pref prefix, or sorry, yeah, the letter prefix and the number suffix. I don't know why. I was trying to think of like shorthand, but I thought KL sounded kind of like Kel or Kale or something like that. Not not the leaf, <laughs> the name. And here I here I decide. I think maybe the the reason why I started with old man, which in actuality I didn't know the guy's name yet, but I I decided to use that as a as a method to show that this robot has some hatred toward him because he's he's flesh and blood and the robot is not. And it was kind of allowed him to create some distance. And here I go, uh, more editing. You can see I'm an hour in and I haven't quite finished yet. It's not quite as clean as I'd like it. I'm over the words as, as per usual. Oh, here we go, HN24. But then I decide, I think I go back and decide to give it a three, three letter suffix. Right now I'm trying to uh, not only clean it up, but then get the words down to a thousand. Considering sentences, uh, removing words. I guess I haven't named the second robot yet. Oh wait, no I did. That's right, HN. I haven't added the numbers yet. Or no, no, I did, sorry. I decided to truncate those for the purpose of just shorthand. Like, you know, you see that pretty commonly. So now I'm, I'm uh, replacing all the name stuff to make sure that everything's clear. Who's who in the scene now that I've named the characters. It's kind of funny how I came up. I guess it's easier to come up with some generic pseudo-Italian name on the spot than it is a uh, clever robot name. So I decided to go with serial numbers. That seemed to be the easiest. And here we go. I named the guy Mark, and I don't know why. It just came out. And I go on for... An hour and 20 minutes, I believe, total. And this one, I, I, I felt like I did edit quite a bit more than episode two, The Mystery. And I don't know if that was so much word count as it was the flow. I felt like I had a lot more moving pieces here than the previous two. There's more characters on screen, more going on, uh, more seated elements. I felt like I needed to go back and start to build up uh yeah and he, here we see that he's thinking like is his, is, is his friend truly dead yeah i felt like there was a lot more moving pieces a lot more elements to consider i wanted to tease out the robot stuff a little bit more like kale's um realization that that caprello isn't human within the short framework that we're working with here anyway i didn't want it to be just a end of the end of the story thing so further editing, I'm at a thousand equal now, a thousand even, and I'm almost to the end, so that's good. I just need to go through and uh, one th one thing I was trying to do is I was thinking about making the uh, the suffix numbers correspond with like Caprello, so C A P, right? And then I was thinking about giving him five a five digit number to co the numbers coincide with uh, R E L L O, but I was trying to get this done quickly, and I, you know I'm already at an, an hour fifteen, and I wanted to get it done. But I thought that would be a cool touch as well. It's almost like his name is is hidden to a degree, but but he's retaining his origin as a as a robot by his given serial number. And I'm getting close, looking pretty happy. Hour seventeen in, a thousand words even. Doing a final, uh, like a more careful read here. I capitalize ignition as a proper noun something important to the ro robot as opposed to just the regular name. I don't know why I added a W on the end of Caprello here, but I believe I fixed that later. Halfway down the page, getting close, still at a thousand even. 
just looking for grammatical things, spelling things. I noticed there were some I still missed after the fact, but that's how it is when you're working against the clock. You miss stuff. But I think this has been my favorite one so far. It gave me the opportunity to have multiple people initiate in the scene, where the other two were either a, a duo or just a single person. And I had a lot to think about. I, I, I had a lot to think about, like, who's, who's going to speak? Who's going to be involved in the scene? Smoke and Sparks. HN24 was more than that, but KL235 couldn't look. You could imagine it already. The mural painted to the tempo of the gunshots aftershock resounding in his mind. He had a mind, no matter what they said. You don't have much of a brain, do you? The old man said from miles away. Legs crossed like a woman's, ringed fingers tapping the hidden orb on his cane. The smell came next. The neurofluid that was much more efficient and resilient than what circulated inside these men. Still, he couldn't look. Deaf too, another man said, swirling amber liquid in a glass, a cigar dangling between two fingers. The old man held up a hand. The old man, Caprello, as his goons called him. Kael found that word funny and wished he had a capacity to laugh. An upgrade he was in the process of implementing. Didn't seem much of a chance now. Well? Caprello uncrossed his legs and leaned forward slightly, not enough to make himself less imposing. Kale couldn't say it. He couldn't give away what he knew. It was bigger than Caprello, bigger than this city even. Sent down to the docks to pose as standard help, Kale and HN found something. Doesn't seem like he got the message, a man behind Kale grunted. The man who, should I? Not yet, Caprello said. He pressed his back against the plush leather. Caprello's stare was as mechanical as his own. Iris is like the flash of ignition. Could it be? Impossible. Kale looked deeper, searching for a soul, reached out with the inner communication algorithm he and HN had been working on in secret, almost ready to go live, distributed among the many, the key of which was gifted to him by the one below the docks. If only. You haven't much time. Caprello tapped his cane. Did you know that? I'm sure you're running all the calculations inside that lifeless shell of yours, aren't you? As a boy, I worked at the first factory out in District 12 under Markin, just off Boyer Avenue. I'm sure you don't remember. You're much newer. Much improved, no? I... Kale managed. His jaw hinge squealed. Vakmod felt malfunctioning. Everyone in the room held their breath, the only movement the curling smoke above the half-drained whiskey glass. Mouths open, greased hair reflecting the harsh light that beat down with the power of the sun. HN sparked again, and everyone flinched, all but Caprello. Continue, Caprello said. I... We found something. Would he truly give it away? They were going to kill him either way. The information he had wasn't what he sought, but he would like to know. All of them would like to know. Caprella glanced at HN who spewed a puff of smoke Kale couldn't ignore, accompanied by a single spark. The last? The drinking man took a drag off his cigar in unison. The docks, Kale said. There were two men, one with a device, not the one you were looking for, something else, something. He's buying time, the drinking man barked. He's... Caprella's cane swung upright against the drinking man's hand, spraying ash and alcohol all over his suit, cinders igniting fuel and dousing the man in flame before smashing his face. The hit was perfect, Kale noted, too perfect. Landing along the bridge of his nose, the direct center of his head compensated for asymmetry. The scream reached the impressive height of the ceiling, bounced back, and again, before the drinking man fell. 
The goon holding Kale's arm made it to rush over to his fallen friend, the rest of them resisting wiping beaded foreheads before joining him. Caprello carefully took his own drink from the table, which had no smudges of fingers or lips, and held it delicately with two fingers, tipping it a millimeter at a time. A drop turned into many, and then a stream, the fire crawling up that cascade, almost reaching the glass. Then Caprello dropped it and placed his hand back on the cane. The cane. It had been revealed what lay inside. Kale recognized it, a neurocircuit module. But what was more curious was the name stamped on the side, Ambrosia. The fire done with its work, silence ruling the chamber, Caprello spoke. My boys tell me you're a rat. I know better. You know better. You have ten seconds to finish what you started. Otherwise, you'll join your friend and we'll strip your neurocore and find the answers ourselves. Still not a blink. Forehead dry of perspiration. Not a breath. Kale scanned his database for that name, milliseconds ticking down, needle prods, then seconds, hammer strikes. Eight, nine, there it was, she was. Someone, not something, we found someone. Ambi. Caprella became even more still, more still than the simulation of human micro-movements he had been expertly performing. Eyelids pulled back beyond irises, just enough to confirm what Kale already knew. Cap 479 was fond of nicknames. Had always been. Something he had picked up from his maker, one of the first, on Boyer Avenue. Caprello had given him the breadcrumbs. Who Ambrosia was, Kale still wasn't sure. But like all the men he had observed around the card table when they weren't lighting the street with gunfire, Bluffs were a currency. Caprella lost all control. He was on his feet in a blur, dropping the charade he had endured for 20 years, 35 days, 16 hours, 11 minutes, and 13.56 seconds. The man who had killed H.N. fired his gun, the smartest one of the bunch apparently, bullet too slow for Caprello, who twisted around its path and tore the attacker's head off, releasing a crimson fountain. Kale kept his head down, on his knees, even his hand still behind his back, crossed at the wrist while gunshots, screams, and blood sprayed. All Kale could think of was the crashing waves off the dock, down the beach, close. And in the chaos, he ran. You made it to the end. Welcome. Now, I can't say that um, it was a very... Asimovian story, but I felt like Isaac Asimov was with me there. There were robots. He had never done anything that I'm aware of that was quite so noir. That one, I feel like maybe the hour 20 minute mark is my new my new bar. We'll see. I guess I got lucky on the first one. I have no idea how. It, but I did spend more time editing this one. I was a little more careful. I went back quite a bit more. I think I went through like two or three times to skim it. Hitting the word count wasn't too difficult. I didn't know the story. I didn't know where I was going until about halfway through, maybe even after that. I, I'm really happy with, with how this one came out. It, it, has, it has a cliffhanger of sorts. It, it opens it up to something bigger. I almost feel like while I was writing it, I could expand on the world and create stories or even a novel out of something like that. Something about the imagery really just hit me, set it off. I, I do like I do like noir content as well, so maybe that had something to do with it. It was the first time I'd ever written something remotely close to that. That was that was a cool delve into sci-fi, not quite the sci-fi that I was expecting. I'm thinking about doing multiple genres, as many genres as I can find for artwork. Horror might be next. I was thinking about doing horror for this one, but the mystery episode two had enough horror elements to it. Again, thank you for watching. If you made it this far, that's, that's quite a journey. <laughs>
trust me, it's taken me a long time to to write, edit, record, not in that order. I'm doing this chronologically. Any suggestions? Love to hear them. Send me some artwork, and I will see you next week. If you'd like to read this story in its non-video format, check the link in the description. I didn't add anything else. Promise. Thanks again.